Okay. Um, welcome everybody to our Planning Commission meeting this evening. Let's go ahead and get started with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you all please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Uh, I've asked Commissioner Hoff to give us a thought and prayer tonight. To turn it over to you. Okay. Um, so over the last little bit, I've had an opportunity to travel California. I did get the opportunity to travel to Brazil, and it got me thinking a little bit about seeing a lot of different people in the world. And the overall, the overall thing I remember when I was in Brazil, you see some of the people down there, and you're like, oh, they, 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 it seems so such like a a different country compared to us, but the people are there and they're all trying to be happy just like we are. They, they want happiness and overall they're very happy people. And some of them live in a lot different cir circumstances than we do. But the one thing that I noticed is that, is that they want happiness. And then I got to thinking about what brings happiness. And there's a lot of different variations that people can think of. Some people go to substances or some people go to you know media some people go to you know just being around friends but one of the things that i thought of was in brazil there is a very clear um <laughs> to bring this back to what we do in the planning commission they don't have necessarily the plan or the the guides and the um the the zoning that we would have here in the united states and i know that they do to a certain extent but you see a lot of a lot of buildings or homes being built, maybe where they shouldn't be, or tapping into the electric grid where they shouldn't be. We I have a picture of um, this this area where there are probably over a hundred, if not two hundred, wires going in and then going out to these houses, and it just looks like a ma mass chaos, just chaos. And I was just, and it got me thinking in regards to um, what we do here. And, we're, and while sometimes I know that a lot of people may think that within the Planning Commission there are, oh my gosh, there's so many hoops to jump through just to build just this building here or to, to get a, you know apartment complex going or whatever it may be. But on the other side, I see what happens when it doesn't. And what happens is with, with that, there's some unhappiness when there is not order. And so I, I know in my life, if I don't have order in my home or order in my life in, or in, in regards to organization in any, any way, I feel a little bit less content. And, and so that got me thinking about what was happening there. And that definitely breeds in content when, when people are like, I, I don't know if my electricity is going to turn on or if my house is going to stay or if someone's going to do this in this community. And we have rules here that kind of keep us in check. While they can be kind of frustrating sometimes, I believe it actually gives us happiness and contentment, which overall brings that happiness. And so that was kind of my, my thought over the last little bit after seeing that. And, I, and don't get me wrong, I love Brazil and I love it. And, and, I, and they are very happy people in a lot of their ways, but that was one way that I saw that we are different and it does bring some contentment here for a lot of the citizens in Centerville. So, uh, and I'll offer a prayer as well. Great, thanks. Okay. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be able to meet here together as a commission. We're thankful for the, the circumstances in which we live here in Centerville. And we ask that you bless us as we are, are um, listening to the, the things that we need to um, evaluate and be able to solve, that we may be able to be guided and be able to help the, the people in Centerville as well as, as help this community continue to thrive. We're grateful for the great community in which we live and for the opportunity that we have to serve in, 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 these, in, in these things. And this we pray for in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Order is progress, right? Isn't that the, isn't that the saying? It is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go ahead and get started then with... Uh, um, the first item on our agenda is a zone text amendment uh, regarding development or use of a parcel. This is a legislative decision. And we'll turn the time over to, wait, who do you turn it over to? Corey? You, you can turn it over to me. I'll just do a quick introduction. This is one of your goals. And the idea was to streamline for single family development 
instead of being a two-step process and some of the things that you've experienced even in the recent past, to try to make that an administrative approval um, and change the ordinances to allow that. So Lisa is the actual, our city attorney has spent all of the time writing this. I had, other than a memo, I didn't really have anything to do with it. So <laughs> okay. probably ought to turn it to Lisa for questions or a quick explanation of the approach. All right, Lisa, quick introduction to the approach. Yeah, so as Corey said, this was something that the Planning Commission had on their goals. Um, I always like to try to make things more efficient if, if we can. And we were seeing a lot of these conceptual and final. Uh, so I went ahead and just searched our entire zoning code for parcel or lot and kind of looked and there were various sections that I wasn't necessarily aware of. So I think this was a really good exercise to clean up our code. Um, so essentially, I'll just go through these and, and we can talk about it, but I think it'll be helpful for you to understand sort of the thought process. But uh, the first change is in our definitions. So I went ahead and looked at what our state law definitions of uh, lot and parcel, and they were a little different than ours, significantly different in terms of the lot definition. And when the state law defines a term in LUDMA, I prefer to use that term because then we use the same case law. We, whenever state law uses the term lot, we're consistent. So I just wanted to change our definitions to those state law definitions um, and also referring to that state law. Um, we can certainly add to that definition if you think we need to, but again, I think it does cause some some problems in interpretation. But, um, and then we also had some definitions of lot, like lot depth, lot width, whatever, and on, on a number of those lot dimensional terms, it said lot or parcel. This was the only term that didn't say lot or parcel. So it, I'm just being consistent with, you know, because lot and parcel are two different things. Lot is in a subdivision, parcel is just meets and bounds. Um, so previously, we did have provisions in our permitted use section about development on an unplatted uh, parcel. And it just said, if you want to develop on this, you, you need to either have a subdivision or make sure you put in the street improvements. Um, but in our site plan ordinance, it said, oh, but here, you, you need to go through site plan approval you know, for certain types. So anyway, I'm just taking this out of permitted. We are still proposing that it just be approved as a permitted use by the zoning administrator, but I think it's better to take it out of here and just put it in new provisions where it's, you know, where we're specifically talking about this. So this just says, hey, if you want to develop on a parcel, look at this other section in 1255 where we really talk about it, whether it's commercial or single family. So then we went to the site plan review, which is where the current provisions are saying this, this was historically, uh, I guess currently as well, if you want to do residential development on a parcel, then you have to go through site plan. So I've, I take that out, subsection E, um, and then in 1255 is where I decided to add all these provisions um, because we already talked about lots and parcels. Um, but if you read that section, it's really just talking about, you know, constructing. And so anyway, I wanted to put a reference to these, these new provisions as well. Um, so 1255.132, what I'm doing here is acknowledging that we have a different process for single family development on a parcel than any other kind of development. Because before we said residential, but, but we are just saying um, single family development on a parcel, you're going to follow this procedure. Everything else, you're still going to follow site plan. So if you want to do a commercial project on an unplatted lot, it made sense in my mind to say, look, you still have to follow all those rules and regs. But then 134 says, and here's what we're going to follow for single family development on a parcel. And so we are streamlining it to, it doesn't come to the planning commission at all. It is designated as a permitted use to be reviewed by the zoning administrator. But I did want to make sure that as part of this process, we're, we're really requiring a lot of information up front in terms of the application. It wasn't really clear before because 
the site plan process didn't exactly align. Like there were so many things that are not applicable to building a home. The site plan is really for commercial development. And so rather than just referring back to that laundry list, a lot of which didn't apply, you know, and makes it complicated, I just, I went through conceptual subdivision, preliminary subdivision, final subdivision, conceptual site plan, and final site plan. And I took out of those five sections what I thought Corey might want or what seems most applicable to, you know, a, a develop, a, a single family development. And I was just looking through these again today, and one I thought, I don't know if you have to have, but it does require an accurate and complete survey, which sometimes is costly. Um, those can be a thousand plus dollars. So I don't know, you know, but that's where I got all of these. I didn't really make anything up. I just took them out of our other provisions and said, look, this is what we want in the application. Lisa, um, if I could just express, I read through this. I know that that's kind of a, a, a big apple or a big expectation to some degree, but the concern that, uh, and why I'm kind of supportive of it, and I think it's just a va somewhat of a value judgment of what Lisa's put in, is that we have unplatted lots in areas of survey air. Mm -hmm. And so we had a Moser, I don't know if you remember, the Mosers came in just off of 400 East. Um, they discovered in the process, even though we approved it through the way we're supposed to, they discovered that the sliver piece, it wasn't really a sliver, it was a portional piece. They discovered that that was not owned by them and became a large gap in the survey. And so we did all the approvals, then they had to go back and fix all of that, get with the neighbor, get the adjustments, because we found out they didn't own it. And so I, I know it's it's expensive, but I don't, I'm not saying we luckily caught it. I think we caught it because we were verifying the easement locations, because mm. that's a process. But that's how we caught it was, oh, you can't put an easement there because that's not yours. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point because yeah. actually a lot of these parcels have never gone through city approval. Yeah. Whereas when you plat something, it goes through conceptual preliminary final, this laundry list that you're familiar with. So yeah, I do think that's a good point. And, and also, since this is at a staff level, it gives us a lot more information from a surveyor, you know, that, that can provide that. So maybe, maybe that is a legitimate, because we will be saving them time and money on not having to go through the, the site plan route. And sometimes time is actually quite a bit of money. So yeah. um, maybe we, so that was the only one when I was looking through it. So. At, uh, more specific application requirements that are tailored to this kind of application. And then the last um, section is just saying, okay, well, and these are development requirements. And these are already sort of listed here, but I just want to make sure, because this is what we, use, as staff, we usually worry about with a parcel. Ha have, do you have the public improvements, like curb, gutter, sidewalk, you know, do you have street right-of-way dedication because sometimes they they go clear out to you know the street and it's still they still need to dedicate the right-of-way which is how we get right away and then also the public utility easements and this came up as part of our development review committee saying we also at this level we check to make sure they paid impact fees because sometimes it hasn't been developed and we always know with a lot we charge impact fees with the parcel we have to go through that as well um, and then the one catch-all that will be sort of problematic is I said, look, in terms of building on this parcel, you still have to comply with all lot requirements for any kind of subdivision, meaning you have to have the right amount of frontage. You have to have the right amount of acreage, you know, for the zone. So that one's going to be the hardest for Corey or, you know, to review um, but I think we can just prepare a list of, you know, a checklist of things to look at um, under that because I did, that's an entire chapter, yeah. 15.050. But that's stuff that Corey's used to reviewing as well, right? So it shouldn't be completely out of the order. And when I reviewed that, I just thought we'd have another chapter in here if I tried to recreate. So right. that was the one I did refer back to. So, um, but yeah, so I think uh, staff is recommending approval of this and it does require a public hearing, but um, hopefully this will be helpful for people in the future. 
Um, it, it's still a lot of review, um, but I think with the application requirements, we will have a lot of information to answer the questions we need to, which sometimes at conceptual site plan, we don't. Yeah. At conceptual site plan, what that you require eight to 10 items in it. So this will actually be more burdensome for them up front, but they'll likely be able to develop it. So they're not, uh, they don't have a lot of risk. And then one. just so you know, a process when they apply, we'll use the same thing we do with site plan amendments. It's a, it's a template approval where there's an actual report generated just like you would see in the planning commission going through the standards and then there's a recommendation there's findings attached to it but in this case there's a there's a section that gives approval date by whom so mm -hmm. there'll be a record yes it's well documented the zoning well administrator documented. decisions okay uh any questions for staff Lisa or Corey? No? I think it was, yeah, well done and well explained. Thank you. Uh, okay, without any questions for staff, um, we will jump right into the public hearing. And we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing, invite anybody to come forward. Since nobody's here, we will close the public hearing. Thank you, everybody. Uh, any further discussion, thoughts, comments, concerns um, before we make a motion? No? Okay. Anybody want to make a motion? I think he's got it. I'm going to do it. Oh, wait. I had it, and then I didn't have it. <laughs> now I have it. I hereby make a motion for the Planning Commission to recommend approval of the proposed zoning text amendments to streamline the process of approving residential development outside a platted subdivision as, as proposed by staff with findings A through D in the staff report. Say it loud so everybody can hear it. I second the motion. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion to the motion? I just really appreciate the work of staff in making this happen and being thoughtful of how to, you know, a lot of times, as you said, we have these things to help keep us orderly and, and make sure we have joy or happiness or whatever. And I think this is gonna bring people some happiness to not have as much, uh, as many steps and, and to really help try to streamline this. So thanks for your work. Yeah, I agree, and I, uh, as far as the survey goes, I don't think that's an unreasonable ask for that in this case, because... They'll probably have one anyway. Well, I think they probably need to get one if they're that's developing true. an area outside so, of the process, true. you know, and so... And any existing utility. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure they're going to be doing that anyway. It'll be, it'll be good for them to do that anyway, so... Okay? Anything else? No? Okay, well, then we will uh, vote on the motion. Aye. Aye? Aye. Aye. Great. That motion passes. Chair Daly, I think I yes. know why the candy's on the dais. This was one of your goals. You can break it out and celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Perfect. Okay, let's go on to the next item on our agenda. This is the moderate income housing strategy discussion continued. So, Corey. Yes, and I do kind of hope in a secret realm of writing this memo that you went really Corey because I went more than five <laughs> strategies I am actually so glad remember I was pushing for <laughs> I more remember you were. <laughs> Kevin wanted to limit it and, oh that's okay and Mike can start slashing now <laughs> yeah and my excuse yeah. is is I started seeing some interrelations oh. yeah where you're they're, they're subtly different in some sense, but you're kind of, you could be potentially working on two or three at the exact same time. They might land in different timelines, but exactly. you're kind of doing the same thing. So um, I did select it from kind of the partnership viewpoint that it would take, and then some of our own investment strategies. I think a highlight that was pretty clear and seemed favorable was the idea of employees and some type of mortgage assistance to encourage an opportunity to live in the city employed in. So, um, and then I think we had some other things like <clears throat> reduce wave in 
impact fees for moderate income housing. That's a little bit, I think that's easy to do from a procedural standpoint. The issue is, I think the commission highlighted what I kind of heard was incentives to development community may not be as successful. So that is one where you, you're, you could be favoring a developer, but it also could be interpreted to help somebody buying a unit and, and reduce those costs. So I left a couple of those in there. But at, at this point, um, the idea is to kind of discuss these, get kind of a direction of what we want to go. And it doesn't have to be that we've made the final decision in my mind, but enough of a direction to notice for the next meeting the intent to amend a general plan and include strategies and give the commission some time to put that out into the public. Now, the diff not the difficulty, but the strategic decision was making is trying to figure out a way to also let the public know and, and participate and invite an active participation in the process. And that hasn't really come to fruition in my mind yet, being a sole planner and trying to figure out all the fires that go on each day. Literally, pun intended, we lost a home in a fire. And my neighborhood, that's it caused, been in my your neighborhood. Neighborhood's in it. It's caused a lot of, your, lot your of anxiety chaos. in the neighborhood. I'm the, I'm the bad part of town, guys. <laughs> I always think of the East Benches. That, yeah, the East, the East Bench, <laughs> bad part of town. Yeah. So the, the horizon is, is we need to get to the council at some point before October 1st. Mm -hmm. That's well, the that's horizon. Right. I think we're uh, I think we're doing well. We're giving ourselves time to to do this, and that's great. So yeah, I you know I wasn't I wasn't upset when I read ten things and whatever. <laughs> so it's all right. Because they're all good. There's all some options. Well, they are very. There are some very strong similarities between many of these. So I can see why you did that. Um, anyway, anything else, Corey? Are we ready to? No, just hash it out. I I, I really like the idea of kind of putting it into the partnership realm because one of even my frustrations working here for the 18 years has been that we've done some density. Now we can argue what that density really means, but we've done some density and it's not really making or influencing the market enough. And I think that's everywhere. It's not just Centerville, but Centerville is one of those communities where you know, prices are relatively steep, regardless of what you build. And I keep bringing up Porter Walton because that's probably a large angst in the community when that came in. And there was still 400,000 before the inflation of housing. They were, now, you gotta be fair, they started at 350, but by the time you add a decent carpet and a decent cabinet and a decent yeah. Yeah. porcelain yeah. toilet rather than the cardboard one. They charge you 400000 Okay. Hardboard wouldn't bring me happiness. <laughs> no. No. You got to get the Ferguson. That's what I've heard. So, I'm just kidding. Um, all right. Well, that's good. I think, um, I don't know how, as, as a commission, do we want to go through these, you know, one at a time? Do we want to try and highlight some... Favorites or not favorites, or what? How do you want to do this? Do you think I've got an idea, but I want to hear how you guys want to do it. I like the idea of going through them okay. just because there's not a ton. Yep. Um, I wish we had more commission members here for this meeting, but I think we can move forward, obviously. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, let's do this then. Let's just go through them real quickly. There's 10 of them. Uh, there are some strong similarities between many of them. So uh, we probably, we don't, we won't have to spend 20 minutes on each one. Let's, right. hope, let's hope we don't, in fact. But let's start with the first one uh, on, so demonstrate utilization of a moderate income housing set aside. Is that what that's supposed to be? From a community reinvestment agency, redevelopment agency or Community Development and Renewal Agency to create or subsidize moderate income housing. So. Yeah, so the concept behind this is, you know, if we have some ability with, you know, cities have various programs. Yeah. You know, the one that's related to Centerville is the Redevelopment Agency where um, you can set aside funds in an RDA area 
uh, specific to establish, to preserve um, or create a housing. So that's one of the funds that could be used as a goal for the RDA to identify the funds, what they're willing to set aside and budget, look at the, look at the parameters of what's been adopted, see what allows them to do. But that can also transfer over to some other program to help fund if, and again, I'm not an expert in RDA, but if it can be legally directed towards other efforts of establishing housing. So my question on that then, Corey, is do, it doesn't necessarily have to stay within the RDA or the the boundaries, of the physical boundaries of the RDA, right? Because an RDA has physical boundaries. physical boundaries. So an example, I do believe we went with some grant funds at one time and helped Pheasant Brook and we coupled with that to help them do their stormwater management in their parking area because that was deemed as a project that and that was the RDA that did that? I think it was the RDA and CBDG, is that what that acronym is? Use those funds. Um, so those are, yeah, it doesn't have to go inside the RDA project. You just, and I don't know the agreements of the other RDA areas. That's the other thing that they'll have to check is yeah. agreements. So it's, can we use some existing agreements or as they establish new ones, they can give a commitment to that. So remind me of this then, Corey, I know that the City Council is the RDA board in Centerville. We only have one RDA, right? Correct. We have, th we have one, two, three, four areas of RDA um, programming. Okay. Does, so remind me, this is for, that we're going to get really basic here. Does the RDA have income of its own or does it pretty much just get its income from the city? Like it, does it ask for the city? No, that's a good question. It comes from an increment. So when you establish an area, there's a base, and then they estimate what over time it's going to be, establish whether that has a cause, work with the taxing agencies to see if they agree. Sometimes it's a holistic uh, taxing agency functioning as a board. Sometimes it's individual negotiated with the taxing entity. If everybody or whatever the terms hit that right amount, and everybody believes that if the incentive development exceeds the base tax collection, then for X period of time, they can take that difference and they have a, budget, a general outline budget of where they're going to divert those funds. Stormwater management, sewer line construction, road construction. Uh, they've set it aside uh, for loans in one area uh, for employment and used it for that. So they budget it and, this is, and tell the taxing entities, this is where we're going to be. And at the end of the X period of years, the estimate of what the value of the property will be, you know, they give up a certain percentage through the years, hoping to get that long-term version of the f higher tax rate. And so there is some budget set and some basic guidelines, but um, so that's how they generate the income is it's coming in increment. The way Centerville does it is we don't go out for bonds against the RDA. We do it as a developer risk. Um, you build it. And if it's something that's funded to refund for sewer, stormwater management, if it generates the increment, we'll then de debate and discuss and hold the meetings for reimbursement. If it doesn't generate the increased tax, well, you, sorry, Charlie, you lost out. Okay. And generally, RDAs do okay. I, I mean, our best generated area is the Megaplex. Our uh, target redevelopment area does pretty good. Um, we have the uh, new one, which is the Young Power Sports, so we don't have any data on that. And then we have over by where Salmon and Parish Creek development is, we have a CDA air over there. Does that base ever get adjusted? The, uh, the budget's set off of that base, and then there's a certain amount that they're willing to do. So in some, it's a 50-50, 50 goes to the taxing entity, 50% goes to the RDA in increment. I mean, like the, the target area, the target RDA, that's probably about 30 years old, isn't it? Yeah, they've extended that, I believe, twice under that. And, and, and that one's functioning as a board, so the taxing entities are a board, and they go back and they extend it at, I think, twice, I believe, but I'm not positive. Mm -hmm. I think it's twice. So when they extend it, does that reset the base? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it resets what how long they'll continue in that program. Okay. 
So they may renegotiate instead of 75%, it may be renegotiated down to a 50-50 at that point. At the risk of making this 20 minutes for this first one, <laughs> uh, just uh, it's fine. We have a redevelopment agency. We have a community development agency. Do we have a reinvestment agency or a renewal agency? I don't believe so, okay. unless they're functioning under the other boards. And do you know if any of those already exist within our like South Davis community area? Um, I don't know outside of us. I tried to provide you the links to what I do, but I don't know. Like, this is under interagency cooperation and coordination, so I'm just wondering um, if those specific agencies, if, if we don't know if they exist within, like, the broader multi, you know, city community, is it, it's okay to have an RDA that has multiple municipalities in it? Uh, the RDA is a geographic boundary and run by wherever that municipality is. So it could be multiple. I'm, I don't know personally of any RDAs that, that straddle a municipal boundary and made up of two different municipalities. So I guess I'm asking. Um, but we do have like the housing community of the county. This is something where I expect that the city could put some effort at the county level to start yeah. creating opportunities to join in in a cooperative agency agreement. Okay. Okay. So I know that on this one it says demonstrate utilization of a moderate income housing set, a, set aside. Is that supposed to be a, a, a hyphenated set aside? Is that what that's supposed um, to be? I copied it from the PowerPoint that was provided by the Utah League of Cities and Towns. So I'd have to go back to the original All bill, right. see if it's just a miss. So if we were to spell. if we were to select this as a goal and start down the road of, hey, RDA, let's talk about this. Hey, Davis County, let's talk about this. Yeah, I think we'd first start with the RDA on this particular one and say, what's your current budget or availability? Mm -hmm. Kind of evaluate what we can and can't do on that, and that's how we'll report back at a, at a period later. But I think it also continues on because it can tie into other strategies here in working with the larger community. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So I don't, uh, you know, I don't hate this one. I think it's worth exploring a bit. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where we can see what uh, what money is available, what kind of appetite there is to doing something like that. I think it's worth talking about more. So anyway, any other thoughts on this one? Okay. Number two, or B, I mean, ratify a joint acquisition agreement with another local political subdivision for the purpose of combining resources to acquire property for moderate income housing. So kind of like we just said. Yeah, and this one's a little bit because now that group or whatever that agreement's going to try to be the developer of a property through a coalition and identify, you know, small projects or large project depending on how the, everybody's willing to co cooperate. And this one sounds pretty much the same as C to me, demonstrate the... And I think the interrelation is, is that something like this could be the one where they, they pool the money, build a duplex unit, and it goes over to the Davis Community Housing and becomes a part of their assets. Hmm. A community land trust program. Yeah, well, they, I, they're under the federal HUD program, but each county has one. And so the just east of the school here, that yeah. they own those two units. Yeah. So, again, so, I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking, this sounds big, you know, will we develop a 60 unit project? Probably not, I doubt we'll pool that much money together, but if there is a way to pool some money together and buy a duplex or a fourplex or build a duplex and a fourplex, the report back is, is hey, there's not an endless pocketbook, but we, we did something. And that doesn't have to be in Centerville, right? Mm -hmm. Like we pool our money and it could be. It could be anywhere in Davis County, I'm well, assuming. And that's the thing that's interesting about both A, B, all A, B, and C is that we could say, okay, we're going to create this. We're going to ratify the agreement. And now we're going to try to, you know, utilize these things. That's, it's, I like that you put them under, you know, similarly next to each other so that we can see the process and not just like these are disparate, you know, ideas or focuses that we're trying to go through. These could be, a, this could be a process 
And I think that's more valuable for both Centerville and our, you know, South Davis County area than just like, oh, we're just going to one off this and this and this. Right. So, but really, D could be the same thing too, right? And D mm -hmm. could be as soon as you've got that, you know, it, it could be part of it. So. Now you could go out to the workforce service, yeah. Ministry, yeah. their grants, and apply for them. Or I really like D, else. actually, personally. I feel like if you have tax incentives or state or federal funds, use them. And maybe they have a project that we contribute to in Davis County, and some yep. of those funds that can legally go to them are used for that program. There you go. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, well. Just keep. Yeah. <laughs> let's, keep, let's keep going. Yeah. <laughs> let's keep going. Okay. Uh, local government regulation A, implement a mortgage assistance program. Um, I'll be honest with you, this is probably one of my favorite ones of everything that's on here. We talked about this a little bit at our last meeting as well. I mean, Commissioner Kerr is familiar with this. He sent me some information after the meeting. So I think this is, I think this is something where we directly benefit the city. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously it's a legislative decision on what to do with employees, but I think it's a, I think it's a really good one where we're looking at what helps and stays in Centerville in this program too. I, felt, I think it also, uh, it stays in Centerville. It shows that we value employees in Centerville and it brings good talent because we have good incentives. I think it's like a win on multiple levels. And even if you ended up with one or two employees, because obviously we have you know, 50, 50 or more employees, we're not gonna fund it for everybody, but yeah. if you had an employee or two, um, whether that's an office administrative or a streets worker or a police officer, uh -huh all of that benefit because the response time from a streets worker for a leak they're here yep most of the time instead yeah. of coming from you know south valley over there yeah you know like i said uh last meeting i think there's some real benefit to having city employees live within the city there might yep. be there's some benefit maybe to not living in the city right corey or a planner who's a community development director who's hated <laughs> and yes. wants wants to go to the local school program <laughs> without being attacked yes so there might be benefit to that too but I think there's a lot of really good uh, reason why you would want to do this so this is one of my favorite ones and I I hope that this one ends up on the on the list for sure how many people does this apply to like what are the amount of um, matters how it, much we have it okay. doesn't well on the requirement doesn't say it just says you got to have an assistance a mortgage assistance program for I I tried to look at programs that are out there um, the first one that I found was one out of uh, Arizona, if I remember correctly. And I think we just, we, we, the city, this is the royal we, it's just however we construct it, depending okay. on how much money the budget exactly. is to flex. Yeah. It's not like we've got endless amounts of cash anyway, so. It might be they, assistance to a down payment. Yeah. It, it might could be. A one-time assistance. Yeah. I mean, a, a rate buy-down or something like that, is that another way that people do this? That's a good idea. Well, I didn't see a rate buy down. The, the, one, the one that I'm referencing was uh, uh, an assistance on the initial purchase. And then it had um, an equity sharing so that uh, the, the municipality actually, when the house was sold, got that percentage of the profits oh. as well. Hmm. So it, like was, it, was, it, it appeared to be a self-sustaining program. Hmm. Interesting. Cool. Also, if there were move outs within, I think it was three. I was going to say, I like that a little bit less unless you restricted it based on time, right? So yeah. obviously you don't want house flipping. No, no, but there's like a three year move out with yeah. this. Like there, there was a cascade of conditions. Sure. Uh, and however, I, this is just in response to, well, what does it look like? I think it's pretty much whatever the city decides to construct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. the, the program I had was through HUD, and that was 20, 25 years ago, it was the Teacher Next Door program, where you buy um, a distressed house, you make Thanks it better, so. and they help you with the mortgage. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Cool. Pioneering, urban pioneering program. Yeah. 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 Own little homestead, huh? 
Okay, B, reduce waiver, eliminate impact fees related to moderate income housing. Uh, we go from my, one of my favorites to one of my least favorites. I was going to say, this is my least favorite. <laughs> this is my least favorite. Sorry, Corey. I, I think it has plus or minuses into it because you are, you are basically giving up things that are covering infrastructure in a exactly. minute. Yeah. Just for moderate income housing, but yet they... You're, you're building it and they're participating in that program and the fair share issue comes into play. But yeah. is that the, the hard part is, will that really, this is I think Commissioner Kerr last me, will actually transfer to reducing the cost of the housing? Mm. Don't count on it. I, I don't like this also because it feels like short term gain, long term loss to me, so. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and it also is, well, we put it in, we reduce it, but then it never, Nobody builds it, and so we know we don't really do anything. Yeah. You know, we got the check mark done. That's really easy. <laughs> That's not what we're going for here. I'm not. I'm not into that. Yeah, let's put that one at the bottom of the list. That's number ten. Okay. Uh, C. Identify and use utilize in this case municipal general fund subsidies, uh, way of construction fees, blah blah blah. So, Corey? Yeah, this one is just simply kind of like we did with the Dual Creek. It's not a, it's apples and oranges, but Dual Creek, we said, okay, you're in a historic district. If you're remodeling a house, we'll give you a percentage off, and a substantial percentage off. If you're tearing down a house, we're not going to give you anything off. But if you build a new house on an unplatted lot um, and you hit four of the ten design elements that make it compatible in the community, we'll give you 25% off. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of that... They're apples and oranges, but it's the same kind of thing is, is that we will subsidize our building official and the process by waiving some or portion of those construction fees if it's going to uh, moderate income housing. Now, I think this is back to the controversy. If a developer is building housing, uh, you know, probably not. But if somebody came in and remodeled a house that... You know, we've got a few less than stellar houses I continually get complaints on. And we had somebody wanted to urban pioneer. Maybe that's a program we could do. Did you say this program existed with Dual Creek? No. It's, a, it's, a, it it's not on the, it's on the construction fees. Yeah. So if they build a compatible design home or preserve in a remodel and meet certain criteria that meets our historic preservation design standards, then they'll get a reduction rate on their building so they can get a, they can get their fees waived, but it has nothing to do with moderate yeah, income housing. Right. Oh, yeah. right, that's so, a different. Yeah. So you're looking on average around. We're pretty low here, in spite of the complaints, because we have not raised our plan fees in the city for over a decade. We'd probably make more money, but then I have to justify how we're spending it. But uh, um, you're looking at average nine thousand dollars for a permit. I mean, I've seen them for homes, you know, a lot more for kids, so forth. But how my thought on this one was: How often do you think, um, besides a developer, an individual would come in and be creating moderate income housing for themselves? Probably not. Probably not going to happen. Probably not a lot. So then, my other question was rehabilitation. So you want to jump down to? Uh, no, no, no. This no, is this still one. The, this is you're headed towards my question. This is my the the rehabilitation portion of this. Oh, I see. And is it rehabilitation of moderate income housing or rehabilitation to create moderate income housing? It can be both, because the language it stated it's it's not defined. It could be both. Um, obviously, you could incentivize the developer, but you could also do it on a remodel. But I think this is the difficulty. It's a program that has to be monitored and tracked. But could you could you limit the scope of it to just to not be for developers, but just to be for? I mean, how do you do that? Yeah, how do you do that? Because <clears throat> you have, you'll have individuals who are also developers. They'll come yeah. in and they'll do it as themselves. And yeah, they'll 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 buy. It. You know, you're going to get into the issue of who's flipping and they're looking yeah. for the opportunity to flip. And then it's back to the issue of how do you ensure that, one, they said it's moderate income housing, but how long does it stay moderate right. income housing? You know, do I use this money towards moderate income housing, live in it for a year, and then I turn around and flip it at market rate? 
could it have now that's remodeled similar to similar to what mason found on that program where it's time bound and it has you know some of these you could but this comes down to now we're locally monitoring that so we've got to create the local staff to monitor track and ensure that that's going on mm -hmm. in your reporting yeah i you know to be honest with you this one for nine d uh even e and f to be honest with you all kind of require a bit of um, monitoring and tracking well so would the so would the mortgage assistance program sure absolutely agree yeah. i think anything we do it's not gonna be like oh here's a here's we're a done <laughs> here's a free way to just check the box right yeah for just for e that can be local but that could also tie back into the program if you worked with another agency and they develop a project for I 55 e. plus i know you may not like the idea of monitoring it but i think it meets the needs of a lot of residents well that's more than monitoring that's becoming a developer yes that's a big lift but if you did that with a yeah like Corey said yeah and, yeah. and frankly a municipality acting as a developer is probably going to have a better outcome for low-income housing than a private developer that's but it, it's a whole different animal a, should yeah. municipalities be into the development business because Park City bought the old farm up there, Tangent, the old barn up, the white barn before you enter the city, bought all of the Oscarthorpe's farm. It was actually the next family member, but I remember it as the old Oscarthorpe farm. Well, they came into it and they dedicated some of the open space, but the cost came into it. So they decided to sell off a portion of the property to help fund the rest of the preservation did not go over well. Residents said, you bought it, you promised it under open space, and now you've turned to be a developer. We do not like that being done with our tax funds. <laughs> so. I just think in, in if you had a interagency, inter municipality, whatever. Then it's easier to It try. feels like that could be a little bit easier to kind of support something like this. Yeah. And again, I, I, I know it may be a little bit difficult, but I like at least entertaining the idea, but maybe it's not something people want to do. So to, to that point, I think that an interagency thing does make a lot of sense in this case, because, you know, for example, West Bountiful, they got to be looking at some of the same stuff and they're not, they're small. One acre zoning doesn't help that project very much, does it? It's not. <laughs> well, and also, I mean, like, they're all like you said they're looking at this but also i let's let's pool our resources and someone monitoring you know it could save us money sure and create options that we wouldn't have otherwise right Especially we do that in a landlocked sort of right we already do that with our you know the fire department that's a pooled resource yeah stuff like that so uh well could we also do that with the management of a mortgage assistance program sure Move into Davis County or them. whoever the whoever the co -op yeah. operative is made up of. Yeah, that that's the only one where I feel like though, if we're really hoping to have it benefit the actual employees of our city, we may want to kind of like. Well, we could, but keep I think that close. But the administration of it, right? Mm. Personally, I think HR is one of the best equipped to do that. Because on severance, you do an evaluation to see if it's in compliance with the program. And then on entry, um, you, you do the application through them. But that's just my feel is that your local administrative staff are going to be able to administer it that more aptly as it's an employee. Yeah, I agree I, because you'll have the records of that employee where a larger group, hey, did you have any employees leave? I oh, forgot to report yeah. that to you. I don't, I don't know that, that one would be as effective as a supposed to do that. larger group, but. Okay. Um, so we're supposed to pick three to five, Corey? The minimum is three to five. You can pick a little bit more and debate them and then narrow it down if you want. But I, the only thing I would say is, is that the idea of going to, to, to cooperative situation, I think is really great. The, the, the failure mode is if other jurisdictions don't have such the same synergy. 
So it's going to take some <clears throat> poking and prodding from Centerville to go out and say, yeah. we've chosen these. We're the leaders. Mayors talk to each other, council members or county talking to the county commission, and, and somehow have some type of leader to go out and say, we don't want to tell you what to do, but we need you to have these discussions and join in with us. But it doesn't have to be a neighboring city either. Like, we could pair up with Sunset of all cities if, if we wanted to, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you could... It's broad enough that you could pair up with anybody if you want to go down to Farron, Utah, and see if they want to <laughs> participate in it. I personally Farron. think that defeats the purpose. Vernon, if you know where that is. Oh, the Mexican hat. I do think in terms of a planning commission recommendation to the city council in order to gain all of our incentives it would be helpful to pick at least five okay and you could say we don't like these two but if you want to do the five these would be the five we recommend well we're gonna we're gonna like the five we're to some like. extent yeah we'll give them the reducing <clears throat> impact fees to chew on the impact fees one will not make the five <laughs> okay so we've got now. the interagency cooperation strategies those are all like we mentioned they can all four. work just pick those four and the mortgage assistance That's program five <laughs> pike drop <laughs> i think the other thing that on the five i don't know that we're required to meet all of these the first year right so oh. it's not harmful necessarily i mean maybe in year five but we can always amend them as well but so it's not harmful to pick too many because you can work on those and we can be flexible yeah um, yeah i think we talked about that last time where we just have to report back on our progress and we can say we've had meaningful discussions with xyz municipalities or whatever yeah, some of these are going to take years to, yes. to really develop and perhaps get some money or find properties or you know, any of those. And I think that, honestly, I think it's just fine if it takes years because then we don't go through and check off the whole list real quick and then we're left with stuff we don't like. Are you kidding me? You think that they're just going to give us this list and then it's never going to change? No, I know. <laughs> it changed. I know. But. Okay, I feel good about those and the mortgage assistance. Does everyone else feel good about that? I feel good. I mean, do we. I think that's a good way to go because. The first four are so related. It's pretty much. And I feel like the other people, the other commissioners who aren't here today, were pretty excited about the interagency sure. coordination. I feel like I'm not speaking for them, but I don't feel like there was Impression. any major. But because they're not here, they don't have the word. So. I just don't think there was any major. I don't recall any major concerns in that. Well, there I think... may be a major concern in the 55, you know. I think what's left, and again, it's you've got the transit-oriented development incentives that are sitting in there that really are irrelevant to us, and then you have the other elements are let's zone for densities, and let's get let's give a density bonus, and it's kind of like the last one. Yeah, that last one. The density or a, a transfer development rights from one area to another to for if you do moderate income housing and and. And so I don't I agree. The commissioners are probably not overly excited about, and the community, just to sure. be honest, they're not overly excited about, you know, over there it's 24 units an acre net. I wish. Still didn't get modern income housing, so. I, I wish the E on the second group, the local government regulation, were written a little yeah. more freely to allow to help those who may be disabled or 55 years old or not not necessarily develop a project yep but maybe a mortgage assistance program yeah for, like a mortgage assistance program or something like that i yeah. think there's a lot of ways to really anyway i agree i i think e would be a spectacular project i just don't know if this is Viable. the city for it yeah. yeah and we'll see how these other ones go and maybe we can revisit that and I mean, ultimately, we can recommend five to the city council and they can toss those five and pick a different five if they wanted to. Yeah, they'll get all of the strategies again to pick from. I, I suspect that they're going to land hopefully somewhere where the commission is landing because rezoning for densities to produce it is probably not a favored yeah. Right. By a lot of communities, because it's like, how do you force it? Well, it's honestly, that's proven not to work. Yeah. So... Well, and again, it goes back to how it's really helping 
the user, the the resident, you know, is that helping the developer, is helping the resident. So yeah. I think you can explain to the city council the justification on why we like these and, I, and we'll see what they say. And uh, tell them to resist the urge to table indefinitely. Okay. They can't. I know, they gotta resist that urge. They love Well, they could, but then we get a 90 day warning. Yeah, they don't wanna do that. Okay, anything, <laughs> anything else we wanna talk about on this one? Good discussion, everyone. Okay, let's talk about item number three, landscaping regulation discussion. Corey. So what you're just getting in the staff memo is some highlights of what our existing ordinance language talks about that I could pick out that talk about water and the discussion of it. And then I tried to introduce in the memo, what is it, five points of thought that were taking place as I review it. So an example would be is, you know, a lot of people say you're requiring turf and, and we don't. We don't require turf. We actually do not require turf in your landscaping. And we do encourage low water, even before we did the water wise, if you read through it, we encourage drought tolerant landscaping. I think where the major conflict in the idea of why turf shows up so easy is so it's A, so back down in the policy, uh, 1251070 landscaping requirements A, A small A, I is that what it is or L? Um, a A A A A I. A A A A R P. Um, <laughs> the 75 percent plantings at maturity. You know that's a lot of what's the creeping uh, spider plant where you. Yeah. Remember the 1940s and 50s? You got that. Terrible plant. spider plant. I forget what it's called. Sorry, I don't know the name of it. 75% coverage of those, plus all your spider friends. You're talking about the Fetzers. Yeah, maybe. Those are the 70s. Oh, yeah, the 70s. Those are the worst. Yeah. But 75% plant coverage at maturity yeah. is going to default to turf. Because that's the easiest to plant to get your coverage yeah. at the cheapest rate. So we can, we can do drought-tolerant plantings, but if you're 75%, they're just going to default big head sprinkler with turf. And, you know, we get the big complaint about uh, the new Bank of America and the new newly installed sod there. You want a drought tolerant place. It's just the easiest and the quickest to get installed, done, and taken care of. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's one where I'm thinking we probably should be talking about 50%. Um, but then we have this struggle that's in the ordinance that says, well, now that we want 75% plantings, we're cutting you down on the hardscape surfaces, we're cutting you down on the gravel, the decorative gravel use. I think there's controversy with gravel use, but you know, what are we replacing? If we drop it, what are we replacing it with that you can do? And the default right now is the gravel and rock companies are having a heyday and the sod farms are worried about what their future is. Um, so I, I think that's the that's the tug and pull. We probably ought to reduce, but what do we replace when the expectation is with? Now, give you a perspective, 75% coverage sounds like a lot, but when you apply it to only 10 and 15% of a site, yeah, you know, it's, it's not a ton, you know, unless you're big like Walmart and got a big parking lot. You're, you're saying 10 and 15% of a site, it's just because the other part of the site is the building. Buildings and, and parking. Sure. Uh, so I bring that up and, and try to say, hey, we need to have that reduce the coverage. What are we allowed to replace it with? Um, one thing that's interesting in our ordinance is it's not used a lot. Um, zero escaping. Um, I was always taught that that was a trademark name, but I think it's been generalized to the landscaping community. Zero, not zero. Zero escaping. Um, we allow on the west side because we do not have culinary or culinary. We do have culinary. We do not have secondary water on the west side, so they're they're using our culinary water. It's only 10 percent. So that was one thing the ordinance did in 2003. Is said, okay, we're going to drop it to 10 percent on uh, west of I-15 because you're using the culinary system water, and then it added zero scaping in. Now, true zero scaping is a plant is a. Is, it, I don't want to insult you if you know what it is, but it's, it's a plan where you're going to spend two to three years at first irrigating, and then you're supposed to stop irrigating. Now, 
mm, it's ne not necessarily that successful per se, unless you really are going to grow sagebrush on your on your lot. So, but that's the con. Didn't we talk one time about xeriscaping, xeriscaping? Yeah. And there might even be a third one. There was a third one. Yeah. There was a third one. And you're supposed to use a site plan that or in the site plan process, you're supposed to have a landscape architect that has experience in xeriscaping. Mm -hmm. What we generally get is drought tolerant. Yeah. They'll keep calling it xeriscaping, but it technically is just drought yeah. tolerant landscaping. And so I, I bring that up by saying, you know, today it's going to be hard to go from turf to not much turf and gravel and the push for artificial grasses and things like that that you hear that's out there because that's where everybody's running to. I don't know the future of how much water's gonna be there and are we gonna end up where we truly are doing either uh, Japanese Zen gardens with sand in your front yard or we're going to the Arizona arid style landscaping of yards. Um, but I bring that up. If we're going to do it on that side, should we do it on this side? Should we rethink what we label it? And then I add in the parish lane design guidelines. Um, again, you're back to this percentages of what it means. And then we have this water feature section that nobody's used. Um, and then we have a water element in the Shorelands Commerce Park. And then I add the last and final one, because everybody likes to debate about it still a little bit. Artificial landscaping, does it or does it not play a role in some landscaping scheme? You know, I could see a little putting green for your backyard on a residential. I don't know if artificial plants. And I don't, I would say we have the best artificial landscaping ordinance, not because it's the best ordinance. It's probably the largest ordinance based on palm trees. That was my first thought. It was at what point do lighted palm trees become part of the plan here? Oof. And that's how the artificial landscaping ordinance section was implemented. It was a, a, cont a contest. A contest. About city regulation and I would, and the palm trees remind me of my childhood home. Yep. Vegas? No, Florida. Florida. Uh -huh. So Florida. the idea, one council member won't mention names in the long past, so that way everybody's cleared, if they're watching YouTube or listening, was let's get the artificial landscaping ordinance so that they can do it, and then we'll yank it and make it nonconforming again. It's <laughs> <laughs> one way to do it. But we never yanked it, so. Hmm. Listen, well, along those lines of artificial stuff, I am not a fan of artificial turf, artificial grass. You know, if, it's a, like it says right here on the very top of water features, water features can provide relief from summer temperatures. Artificial turf is hot. Very hot. Oh, super hot. It will burn you worse than the slides on the playgrounds. It'll actually burn you worse than concrete. We were at uh, the water park in Provo two weeks ago, we were walking on the concrete rather than the, the, um, the artificial turf that they had. Mm. Very hot. It's hot. Which doesn't even, which affects more than just right there by you. It affects the whole idea of urban water, heating. urban heat, urban heat. Yeah. water cycles and yeah. all that. So. so I personally do not think that going in here and saying, yeah, let's make artificial turf the plan. No. I think that's a bad long-term idea, you know? Agreed. So, um, so the purpose of tonight is just get your thoughts and discussions, give a little bit of direction on what you want to hit. So I'll go start making changes to the ordinances and we can come back and discuss it. And then once we kind of pare down to we're landing where we want, we can then re-advertise it for, not re-advertise it, but do the first advertisement for a zone text okay. amendment. So it's not needed tomorrow but council yeah. asked us to work on it. And unlike uh, the previous one, the council's not expecting three to five suggestions. Right. No. <laughs> so They just said go back and tell us if there's any better ways we can look at our landscaping ordinance for water mm. use. So, you know, 
my initial thought with a lot of this stuff is, sure, maybe let's go back and reevaluate some of these percentages from 75 to 50 maybe or something like that or whatever. But I don't know that we want to really make wholesale changes and stuff. I mean, there's benefit to having grass around, in my opinion. It keeps down, like if you were to replace grass with gravel, that gravel's gonna end up in the roads and driveways and stuff like that, and it's yeah. gonna end up breaking windshields and- Or lots make, of weeds, because it goes unmaintained. Making a mess. Grass hold, tends to hold dirt down, you know? So there's benefits to it. Now, does that mean that we could, right, we should look at limiting some of that? Sure, let's cut that percentage down and stuff, but let's not get rid of it altogether. You know, so I don't know. What other thoughts do you have? I have to say that after we uh, have done what we've done for the Rip Your Strip program, at least in my neighborhood, which is the bad part of town, so you never know. Uh, Becoming. It's yeah, and yeah, no, like it is. Are you kidding me? <laughs> anyway, no, it's great. It's a great part of town. Um, there have been a lot of my neighbors that have participated in the program and they haven't just done plain rocks that's it like there have been some like one of my neighbors is putting together a beautiful rip the strip she has even like she's she's got a drip system she's got all these different things and she has even just a cement um like planter box as part of the design like a, just a small little thing yeah so that she can put some annuals in there and have that be, you know, flowers in the mix of it all. And anyway, I just think there's, there, there could be something there, uh, not only to have a Rip Your Strip program, but to encourage in new development to initially think of the strip in that way so that they don't have to go through the conversion process of all these, I don't know, that might be something that could immediately benefit some development and landscaping yeah. requirements. So, so let me give you an example of what's kind of marketing out there that I see a change. When I first arrived, one of the community identifiers for Centerville was Fifth Street or Fifth South and Bountiful Parish Lane. We love Parish Lane. We like the landscape berms. Mm -hmm. We like the setback distance. We like the protection of sign pollution. I do too. And so that was the, the Parish Lane design. So we've got those big berms and we have those grasses and the latest with the bank putting and replacing what they did created some immediate calls and frustrations. And they were like, hey, we'll just let it grow a little bit long and we'll still be twice a week. It, it'll struggle, but we can make it survive to fall. And so, but the America First Credit Union recently submitted its plan to go to all plants and gravel. When they found out that the 400 West or 400, yeah, 400 West turns are going in uh, they said let's hold off on that till that gets complete and then we'll come back in so just thinking about it um, you know you're going to lose the grass it's still 75 percent plantings so that'll be interesting they had a lot on their initial plan mm -hmm. i don't know what it I, I didn't even look at it long enough they recalled it the next day um, but is that a significant identifier change to parish lane going to I think it'd be beautiful, don't get me wrong. I think you can do an excellent job, but that, I think that's the difference, is it's easy for grass and turf to look nice once established. Going to gravel and plantings, it can be bad. So across from my office, down there in the west, the young, uh, young Blood's building, it's all gravel and all weeds, still don't have the landscaping in, we're still holding the bond after all this time, and it looks like garbage. Mm -hmm. So it will come down to, I think America First Credit Union has a pretty good PR image of itself, so it'll be really good, but we think that's going to be consistent along Parish Lane, and as we think about a design change, is it good or bad? And I'm not trying to say it is or isn't, I just think, you know, grass has been the identifier, now we put it in new again, People are a little upset. I kind of want to see the America First Credit Union put it in because I think it'll look really nice. But how do we establish that standard that that they'll do it that way? Because other businesses along there, without naming names, haven't seemed to have the same type of commitments to their landscaping. Mm -hmm. in, 
past approvals. So my question, kind of going to, back to that, and I know we were we talked through, you know, the requirements for the rip your strip, and we went through rocks instead of um, not the mulch. What's it called? The bark, bark, because it's better for the storm drain and all these different things. But I I see a distinct difference in some strips that have been ripped and done a really good job to someone who's just like, oh great, I'm just gonna put- Pea gravel. Gravel, yeah, and that's gravel it. Gravel everywhere, gets and everywhere. I, and I'm wondering, were we kind of too open or too flexible in that, or would it be more helpful to give some guidance on specific types of plants or anything like that that would help create a sort of look that we feel comfortable with? Or is that, I don't know, what do you no, think? No, I, I think it was at the time that I recall for the value judgment of the park strip is the council was getting lots of pressure that they, people wanted to participate in. They did some changes to the park strip ordinance. I do think it was a bit hasty in the sense of trying to be able to get people to be able to go into Weber Basin and get it done real quick. Mm -hmm. um, but it also ended up being problematic for staff in some sense because you know, the bark was eliminated because it's getting into the storm drains. Then yeah. it came down to pea gravel. Well, we don't want pea gravel because that gets everywhere too. So it's got to be a certain size. But then if it gets too big, how do you get in with the utilities? If we put in concrete to 50% level, decorative concrete, can't match it. And then you have to tear it out. So if they put in concrete, should we have them recognize if utilities go in, they get to replace it on their own. The utility companies are not going to replace it and it almost got to street trees I mean, we got and that was controversial so and now we're, we're back to changing it again because people want to have a little place to pull up the car take the elderly or disabled person out of the car door get on a cement pad to get onto the sidewalk like a paver yeah and so I, I think it was hasty but i also it came with a huge huge array of problems my Summer, summarizing it, Lisa, pretty quick, what we went through. But it was... It's a work in progress. But it was something hasty, somewhat hasty on what it looks like. Because then we later had some pushback from council members saying, I think gravel's a mistake in the park streets and it's all going to be weeds and look bad. Well, it's, it's not like we can't ever change our mind, right? We can change it. Yep. <laughs> I'm not saying we change it, but I'm saying if that is something that we in Centerville value, one of the ways, I mean, if you look at park strip water use, it's one of the highest. Um, the Wasters. Most, yeah, the most egregious areas of wasting water. So that could be something that looks at landscape requirements and having that, but, but having a really smart and specified kind of direction instead of just sort of like do what you want do what you want and i mean i can i can literally think of you know first south i think it's first south here first north here yeah. there's a house right over there it has gorgeous and i can think of different places in the city where i'm like oh this looks so nice and you can tell it's obviously a water wise scenario um yeah, kind of what I'm hearing you, Becky, is that we could reduce the turf percentage so it doesn't go to turf, mm -hmm. but we need to up the standards of the replacement. Yeah, or have specific direction about the park strip. Or and add the park strip into it. That, yeah, and have and have you know some very specific guidance on not just whatever I don't know. I think that could be a pretty effective way of addressing some of the major water. Could we do that and just go back and say we'd like to focus on the park strip? This is what we did. I mean, to Becky's point, if the park strips are wasting the most amount of water, especially those people who have their sprinklers shooting out into the road. Yep. Yeah, I think, well, I think the council did that already with the water issue. I think maybe the design issue is where all the debate's happening because Utility staff are saying, look, don't get too fancy, don't get too much concrete, because we got utilities in there, and, yeah. and to come back in and replace the gas line with all of the niceties is 
really not a cost benefit. So the park strip ends up by default to not have a heavy design. At one point in time, I just tongue in cheek said, let's just do what UDOT does, eight foot sidewalk against the curb. That's what I was just wondering. What is the, is the big issue with the big, um, I hate like that. zero strip? Once, once again, urban heat. Yeah, and I, I like didn't say I supported it. It just <laughs> became it. a headache. It looks hideous. Because you've got it along Bountiful Boulevard up by the temple all the way down to Eaglewood Golf Course. Mm -hmm. You get a lot of people walking on it because it's such a, you know, a huge sidewalk. Don't we have it on Parish Lane, on that north side of Parish Lane? Is it eight? Uh, yeah, well, you have, wherever UDOT standard is, it'll always be their five-foot sidewalk. Five-foot. It's... But, they, you know, if, a lot of the utilities are not under the park strip, but your gas line most of the time is. And but do you think there'd be a problem getting Utopia to Utopia sits into the 10-foot setback, mostly. Do you think there'd be a problem getting into that park strip, though, if it's got a little bit of landscape in it? It depends on what it is, you know. Like, and how do you put it back? Because there's some people, like, there's some people in my neighborhood that have non-conforming park strips that if the utility had to come along and take it out, it's never going back in as no nearly, nearly as nice as it is now, ever, you know. Well, um, if it's really nice, they'll probably make it nice again. Well, it would take a lot of work to do that. But the other thing, too, is, like, to Corey's point, you know, if you got big old rocks in there, the... Uh, utility companies aren't going to want to come along and have to move rocks out of the park strip yeah. to dig in. those Fitzers bushes we were talking about. Fitzers, yeah, let's do those. Fitzers, let's put those things in. <laughs> so, yeah, I think park strips will always be kind of evolving uh, to some degree because really it sits under the public works ordinance rather than the planning and zoning ordinance. We reference it for street trees and so forth in our zoning ordinance, but but this landscape, 99% of it, we're looking at the private landscaping world. So does this address, does this address the park strip in this private? No. No, just reference, our, lands, our landscaping ordinance just references the use of trees to the park strip. That's all it talks about with park strip. Mm -hmm. See, that's the thing. I'll, you know, I'll be honest with you. After reading through this and this discussion that we've had here, it's not like our parks. It's not like our ordinance is promoting wasteful use of water. No, and that's why I kept trying to say, but there's grass everywhere. You guys got to change your ordinance. I'm like, we actually don't really require it. It becomes now an element of the private owner's choice to, to say, yeah. how do I want to landscape so my lot? So short of banning grass, which okay. I don't think we want to do. I hear what you're saying, but in practice, this may not be encouraging in language, but in practice, what is happening? 75% coverage will default to turf. So, so you can like pat yourself on the back and say, yes, we are not encouraging grass, but if in, if in, if in practice, that is what's happening, then we should probably look at a change. But again, like I said, there are some actual benefits to grass. Grass does a really great job of keeping dirt down, it's easy to put out, right. it's quick to, you know, it can look nice really fast. And it stays looking nice for a long time. You don't have to weed it like you do rocks and whatever else. And so there's benefits to having grass. That's part of the reason why it's there. And I just, I do worry about the, the burden on the private landowner if we start getting rid of the incentive for grass or whatever else, you know, it's gonna make everything more expensive. Yeah. It is more expensive to put in gravel, and now that it's in high demand, it's even more expensive. But I won't talk about gravel pits and dust and things like that where you get it all from. Let's just stay away from those environmental issues. <laughs> Parleys, say no. Oh my goodness, I tell you what. I, <laughs> never mind, that's a different conversation. Okay, so what do you want us to do here? Yeah, what do you want us to do? Is Corey? there is there a kind of targeted places you think are worth evaluating? Can we not add in something about the park strip with landscape requirements or is it just totally off the table because it's... Well, I think you can reference it, but it just sits in the municipal code under the public streets and rights of way and you now have a whole other set of players And that's outside of our jurisdiction. Okay, what about Going back to the Xeriscaping, what if we didn't have it Xeriscape, 
but if we had some sort of encouragement for water-wise plantings? We have it. It's now just doing a better job referencing it. Okay. So you can change that? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Uh, what about incentivizing even more? You mean That's an interesting statement, how to incentivize more. Yeah. So you're saying, though, maybe... So you can go to 10% landscaping if you go to... I'm just saying, tolerant. I'm not saying that, like, full Xeriscape. I'm just saying, if we Drop encouraged water-wise, if we created a list of, you know, plantings that are very helpful, and then people would Would you find, entertain a reduction I don't know. in the overall amounts? Or another place to think about it is, is the park strip, I, or not park strip, the parking lot islands. What is that? So that's the landscaping parts inside of a parking lot. The break up, a big park. Break up. Oh, yeah. Things that you can damage your wheels on if you're not <laughs> paying attention. When you're trying to do donuts in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, the donut inhibit inhibitors. It messes it up so much. I keep thinking on residential scale, but this is non-residential. Non-residential. No, so the thing about it is, is I think like on, uh, well, on... D1, at least 10% of non-residential development shall be landscaped. So what you're saying is maybe we go to 7.5% or 5% shall be landscaped. As drought tolerant. Rather than as tolerant. long as you use drought tolerant plantings. But what's the, but how do we know then that that's going to end up being like an expansion of the building and not just more parking lot? You, you don't. That's what it'll turn into. The incentive, the incentive is is that I can get a little bit more out of my property if I go to a drought tolerant scheme. Right, but I mean, you know, the thing. Not saying it's it works. Right. That's their. That's the model. They have to do the figuring there. But if I have to spend less time figuring out watering and planting and all this other business, and I can just throw down some more asphalt. Asphalt's cheap when it comes to that type of stuff. I might just go for more asphalt because it's cheap. Yeah, that might not I think they will. What about, they will. okay, what about um, drip systems? Well, we require an irrigation plan. So you'll see, I often see it, you may not always see it, but the irrigation plan comes in. But if they're doing turf, it's not going to be a drip, drip system. I mean, most of the time it's spray heads. This is what I'm saying. What if you incentivize a drip system? That precludes asphalt and turf. How would you incentivize a drip system? I don't know. You know how to do those things. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just saying, Becky, you know, not? like, I, you, do, you have some sort of means in which a uh, drip system is a preferred method of watering, of you, you know, and so then that would clearly, in their minds, you know, it would yeah, I mean, some of these things. If I didn't include it in there, but the landscape ordinance has two, two sections to it. You're going to see the waterwise section that we recently adopted. But you also have inside the landscaping ordinance the recommendation of drought tolerant and appropriate irrigation system. It's, it's, it's the 75% coverage that says, yeah, I'm just going to put in grass. But again, but grass, grass is, regardless of the water issue, Grass is cheap and easy. It's a great mulch. Um, it's a great cooler. It absorbs carbon dioxide. Um, there's a lot of good benefits from grass. You know, the struggle that I think comes with grass is, is that we're all trying to keep that grass green in the summer heats. And most of our grass, unless you're putting in the rye or go back to where you had Scott's protected and you have your clover sitting in your grass, we overwater trying to keep it green and nice looking. And, we live and in it's the a shoulder seasons that grass thrives in. But the thing about it is, too, is that residential watering is, is a drop in the bucket compared to other uses of We all of know that. That's the problem about this whole conversation. Is that is we all understand that. Right. Wait, we only use 14% of the water residentially, but 75% of it is outdoor irrigation. So we don't use a lot of water comparatively statewide, but when we do use it, it's outside. It's outside. No, but even residential irrigation is not that big compared to like agricultural uses and other industrial. Oh, agreed. Uses. Well, agreed. but until we can change that, what can we change? 
Yeah, well, that's the thing, though, is that do we want to go ripping out all the grass and all of its benefits for a fraction of a percent? Yeah, you're saying let's give up some of the values that, that are percentage-wise of water use not that high, so let's give up those values, but all the other uses of using water don't change. go unfettered or yeah. not fettered enough, and we sacrifice the aesthetics and qualities based on a minority use of the water systems. Kevin, have you ever heard the story of the starfish? They got thrown back in. Yeah, it mattered to that one. It mattered to that one. Does yeah. it, is it going to save all the starfish? We're not going to save all the percentage of water. You know, we're not going to make a it. huge thing. But I think by saying like, oh, we aren't the majority, so therefore we are going to just throw our hands no, up and I'm say not. whatever. We're just living the way we're living is part of the problem. We can't just do nothing. I'm not saying I hear both sides just so you know. It's duly burdened. I, I don't I don't want to. Well, I know. do. I. I do know this though. So I live right by Dual Creek. And Dual Creek, I know that Dual Creek irrigation gets supplemented by Weaver Basin periodically, but Dual Creek runs all year long. There's always water there. There's always something there. So it's not like we completely run out of all the water. Yet. Well, that creek has never stopped running. So well, yet. I mean, they siphon it off over to the reservoir. Is that what you mean? Yeah, they store it in the reservoir. Okay, because I was like, I go over to it lots of times when it's dry. No, you got to be above the reservoir. Okay, exactly. Okay. Above the reservoir, it's always running. Below the reservoir, yeah, it'll stop running because they're diverting it into the reservoir. Because they, need, it a they have needs. Sure. Ah. I agree with you. It is frustrating. I know that. That's not something I don't think we can change with the percentage of who actually is using the most water. But I do think that whatever we do is going to, to save water is not lost. You know, in our community, in our watershed, it's an important thing that we do what we can, regardless of if we're even in a drought. You know, like it's just smart living. So I don't say that we get rid of all of the grass, but I think we can look at something that could help. Well, here's, you know, it's, again, it's one of those, it's both sides of the argument are legit to each other, depending on how you do it. But I, I do look at it, the landscaping is still a voluntary. The 75%, I do think it can be critically said that you're, solving your problem through the use of turf to get your plantings. If we did 60%, um, I'm still believe that people, it's a voluntary steel system, because we're not mandating it yet, unless we want to go that direction. I still think you'll see turf being planted to cover something. So even if we went to 50%, um, if, if it's a small area, they'll default to the gravel and some plantings probably because they look at it and say, I don't have to come in and mow the lawn. But for Parish Lane and some other places where we have significant areas devoted to landscaping, your landscape buffers, 50% of them have to be in plantings. You start seeing places where turf starts becoming the default. use, And they still can. They still can do it even if we change it to 50. But wouldn't that just do exactly like Kevin said and just creating more asphalt? No, here, because we're not changing the 15% overall. If you oh. go to the incentivization, use the landscaping percentage, yeah, you're right, it'll go to more asphalt. So I think, honestly, that's probably one of our most reasonable approaches to this, is not change the overall amount of landscaping, but just change the, the mandatory way... coverage of 75%. Yeah, just change the way that that landscaping gets configured. And then just loosen up the other elements that can go into a landscaping plan that includes mulches and gravels and things like that. Allow more flexibility. That way people don't feel like they have to just use grass to get up to 75%. Yeah. They might be able to use a little grass and then, oh, hey, we can throw in these decorative whatever no. fetzers. I like that. I still think we should either, even if it's not through an incentive, I think we should encourage water-wise. I know we have a, a section. You know, you were talking about better cross-referencing so that everybody's mean, like, aware of that availability. Yeah. I mean, people will self-select if they're reading through this and they're seeing 
oh, water-wise, water-wise is mentioned so much, da 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 I think that would encourage in a way that well, maybe that's a, is... That's a fair critique of the language structure, yeah. So, Corey, what if we did, I, I'm just looking at this going uh, on the first page of your staff right up, A, 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 little I, the perimeter and internal landscaping, change that from 75 to 60 percent. And then uh, on the next page, Parish Lane Gateway Design Standards number two. Do we change that less than 75 to less than 60 percent? Yeah. Do we continue? And then. And then water elements. Do you want to uh, remove the water elements, leave them in as ideas, and then I hear another edit of better language construction for waterways. Listen, under under that water elements where it talks about but should be used sparingly and every attempt made to limit the amount of water used you know I think, that's fine. I think that's fine nobody's doing water elements but if somebody were to think about water elements and they see that they're like oh yeah if i have to do that then it's going to get some scrutiny you know i think water elements can be really nice and usually they don't i mean if they're with they're self-contained they can yeah. be positive situation. So. We can leave it in. I'd say leave it in. I don't know. Nobody's doing them. <laughs> and if you do them, and if somebody does do it, like, you know. They know how it's, then they know how it's expected to be done. They know how it's expected to be done. Dual Creek's got requirements about water elements. If you're going to do, you know, do it there, it's got to get inspected and all this other business. So. Okay. Anything else we want to direct Corey to do? Just one last one. Better cross references for the water wise drought tolerant. Great. Uh, zero scaping you just want to leave alone. I would say even like if we could add in any kind of language and then cross reference because I know that yeah. Lisa doesn't like to rewrite the same language in a different place you like to just cross reference which is good right I, th I think what happens is is they're reading through 75 percent default to turf don't go down below and say yeah. here's the suggested things to do when you do that 75 percent they just skip it yeah I, I think just having some sort of maybe adding in some language that could talk about it and then reference it I think that could be helpful personally You're landing about where I thought you'd land. <laughs> Great. So you've already got it written? Partially. partially. I mean, Part, partially. I still like the idea of the drip system or irrigation. I don't know. Just talking, through, talking about it, even talking about that kind of stuff will encourage people to think about it more. Yeah, I, I, we can make it so that it'll reference those areas. So it's kind of a promotion language in everything, where they just constantly, you know, that subliminal message. The flash of the Little Diet messages. Coke on every advertisement. You got it. You got it. Oh, you're saying water your lawns with Diet Coke? <laughs> well, <laughs> Donna, Donna waters her plants in her office with Dr. Pepper, and I don't know why, but she does. <laughs> I think she just gets cold, too warm and she waters her plants. Mm. Nice. They still live. That's funny. <laughs> All right. Good discussion, everyone. Let's move on to our community development director's report, city council report. Corey. <laughs> Trying to bring it up here. Okay, so uh, we do have some projects for you. Um, there's a request for overhill, overhill, hillside overlay uh, on, a, on a lot. It'll be an interesting discussion when it comes to you. Uh, the small subdivision waiver, I don't know if you remember back about 1450, 1448 North Main. There's a big, long, wide house on the agricultural lot that was rezoned to RL about a year, a little over a year ago, called the Grazi. Is that ringing On the bell? west side of Main? I think it's on the east side. Oh, I don't know. I think 48 is on, I think Evans on the east side. Grazi project, they want to split off a 
portion of a lot. That's going to be an interesting discussion for you. Uh, Modern Income Housing General Plan Amendment. I'm hoping to get that on at least a meeting, officially advertising the process. It's not necessarily a decision night, but officially get it into the discussion and That'd be good. so that we've got that safety valve of having the discussion, getting a decision and getting it to the council. Because that counts as a general plan amendment. Because that has to, yeah, has to be a general plan amendment. Um, the Parish Creek PDO amendment, they passed as per the recommendation that the commission made. And then there's your goals. You accomplished one tonight. Heck yeah. Can you let me know, I, I, I may, might just maybe miss rem remembering, like forgetting, but is the lane, was it always CW Urban? Mm -hmm. It always was. Mm -hmm. And they decided to use the same houses that they build over here yeah, I'm actually, for that, which was an original thought. That's what I was thinking. I was like, those houses, I saw a thing for them. I'm like, I don't remember that being the design. Yeah, well, they had, a foot, they had a footprint and, and, and not much of an elevation to it. But they weren't supposed to be that modern. modern. That modern. Yeah. yeah. So is that a... But the, we, don't, we don't have a... Because it's single family, we don't have an architectural requirement. State law does not let us regulate oh, the building why. design materials for single family, duplexes, and townhomes, I believe. Hmm. So that's they, why we didn't get to see that. Yeah. Because I felt it felt like to me, I was like, that feels like a surprise. I'm it surprised to... me when the plans came in. I'm like, what? I don't remember you even talking that they were just going to transfer that floor plan over there. Where's the lane? The lane's on Porter, Porter Lane, just up from the frontage road. Like huh. basically the frontage road in Porter Lane. Oh, yeah. I, I won't commit to you, I'll just commit myself, but the architecture is not my favorite. That's just it's west. It's not of my favorite Thursday. either. Yeah. I swear we saw some sort of. I think at conceptual you, you saw some ideas. But we cannot regulate that because it's single family. Yep. Bummer. Okay. <laughs> All right, last item on the agenda is our uh, minutes from the last meeting. Um, okay, let's go through this one by one. We'll start with page one. First of all, just a comment. I do appreciate, Jennifer, the way that you, because I'm assuming you wrote these minutes. I don't. Actually, Katie Rest does. Oh, Katie minutes. does these. That's right. I knew that Katie did that. I forgot. Well, Katie did a great job of making my words sound much more diplomatic. He expressed the opinion that the state legislature's approach to moderate income housing did not solve the existing problem. Pretty sure that's not what I said, but that's what I meant. That's a good thing to say. I <laughs> used stronger language than that. Anyway, any other changes on page one? Page two. Page three. Right. I move we accept planning commission minutes of Wednesday, July 27th, 2022 as unamended. Second. Great. We have a motion and a second all together. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. We're adjourned. <laughs>